So our third ChemEx speaker this afternoon is Dr. Martin Mulvihill. Marty is the co-founder and a managing partner of Safer Mode, a mission-driven venture capital fund investing in companies and technologies that reduce human exposure to harmful chemicals. Marty is also a researcher and advisor for the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry, which he helped create, and where he served as the initial executive director from 2010 to 2015. Marty received his PhD in chemistry right here at Berkeley in 2009, and his research over the years has focused on developing technologies that help provide access to clean drinking water and the creation of safer chemicals and materials based on biological feedstocks. He has a number of publications and patents related to the detection of arsenic in drinking water, and he has developed safer chemicals and materials for the personal care, construction, electronics, and textile industries. So please welcome Marty, who will give us a ChemEx talk entitled Chemistry Innovation for a Safer and Healthier World. Thank you so much, and thank you all for uh taking the time out on this beautiful Saturday to come inside. It's a real uh, honor and somewhat intimidating to be up here. It's been a long time since uh, I, I had to lecture in front of a room this large. Um, but I want to thank Doug and everyone else for the opportunity to be here and really for the opportunity to be a part of the Berkeley community. If it wasn't for the Berkeley community and the opportunities that I've had here as a graduate student and then staying on to help create something new, I would never be up here today. It's amazing what the opportunity that you all have to be at Berkeley. And so if you take nothing else away from what I have to say today, I want you to know that you are in a great position and whatever you do after this, it's gonna be even better. Because sometimes being here can be hard. I remember that. Um, so I have a quick question to start the day. When you're in the store, how many of you look at ingredient labels? Just as I suspected. Although I was a little worried coming to give a talk to a group of chemists. Maybe you guys all thought you knew what you were buying already. Um, but what I've seen, both uh, at the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry and also since then uh, at Safer Made, is that this trend, turning over the back of the bottle, thinking about what is it that I'm bringing into my home, that I'm giving to my child, that I'm you know, putting out into the environment. This is changing the store shelves. It's changing it already. And I could make arguments to you today about the you know, influence of certain hazardous chemicals on long-term chronic disease, but I'm not gonna bother with that because the proof is in the direction that the markets are moving. So brands that differentiate in this way are winning in the marketplace. And these aren't small numbers. These are all from the personal care kind of uh, formulated product space. But if you look at organic food, which I'll argue is where this concern about chemistry starts. So it starts with what you put in you, and then it goes to what you put on you. And then it you know, kind of migrates to the things you wear and the things you bring into your house. If you look at food in particular, in the last 10 years, over $42 billion of acquisitions in that space, in organic food. If we would have been thinking about the ways that we can innovate around bringing safer, cleaner food to people, as much as we thought about some of the other trends of the last 10 years, um, there is a lot of impact to be had. And so what I hope to do here today is talk about the role chemistry has in creating these companies of the future. And look at the names on there, not just of the small companies, but of the people who acquired them. Unilever, P&G, um, uh, SC Johnson. These are not small, radical, coastal players. This is mainstream. And so what I want to tell you about today is the mainstream future of chemistry and some of the trends I see that are going to enable the brands of the future, the consumer products of the future, to be even safer so that Matt doesn't have to clean up so much mess in the future. Let him clean up the mess that's already there, but let's not put anything else out there into the environment for him to clean up. This is not what the future looks like. This may be how the future is presented to you on the store shelves, but it is not what the future looks like. 
That's the good news for you here today as chemists. <laughs> the second thing I have to tell you though, as chemists, you run into this, right? You run into to people making claims that you know aren't true. You run into simplifications of what are actually complex molecular problems. And I think our response has often been to try to correct, to try to teach, to say the public doesn't understand, to say they don't know chemistry. What we need is everyone to know chemistry. What I wanna, I mean, as much as that would be wonderful, don't get me wrong, what I wanna do is flip that around today. And I wanna say, as chemists, how do we see this not as an affront to what we do on a daily basis, but rather an opportunity to do things in a different way? So I'm gonna give you three trends in research that I see exciting young startups taking advantage of that are actually helping make even spurious marketing claims. First one, this is a huge one. It's, uh, if you're in the CPG world, in the consumer package world, world, they call this clean labels. What do clean labels mean? It means that when you're flipping over that bottle and making a decision, your average consumer wants to see as few things as possible and they hit them to be as easily pronounceable or otherwise make them feel good because they're coming from biology. It's just what people are looking for. I'm not making it up. It's why they're reading the labels. So what does that mean for you as a chemist? Right? So I'll give you three examples of companies that are taking advantage of that, doing really cool chemistry, and bringing something to the market that fits in with this clean label trend. So the first is Mimikai. This is a is an insect repellent company. It's not yet available on the market. It'll be, it's going through EPA regulation right now. It's an actual technology licensed out of NC State University, but it is a molecule, 2-undecanone, a molecule, of course, but it comes from a wild tomato plant. And they went through all the trouble, not of growing wild tomatoes and pulling them out. The nice thing is it's also a, a molecule in the flavor and fragrance industry. So it has a long history, it has a synthetic route to make it. We know that it's affordable. And instead of just putting that out there and saying we have something better than DEET, they also put a whole package around it. They said we're gonna formulate something that for a solvent, we're gonna use seed oils, so things that you can derive from nature, that's gonna look nice on the back of the ingredient. You're gonna worry about oxidation, both in those oils as well as the, the um, active molecule. So instead of putting in uh, a traditional preservative or uh, other sort of oxidation um, blocker, they use a rosemary extract. Again, it looks nice on the label, but is a functional chemical ingredient. And what you get is a final product that if you stick your arm in a cage full of 200 hungry mosquitoes, they don't land on you. Same as deep. And that's what you want, right? This is about a future of functional chemistry that can produce a clean label and is just as good as the stuff that's out there today. That's where the opportunity is. That's the challenge I put to you in every place that you turn over a label and are looking at something you don't like, whether it's isothiazolinone uh, preservatives uh, or um, DEET, you can do better. Second two, I won't take quite as long because otherwise I could literally do this all day. I love talking about the exciting chemistry that's out there. Second one, Taste Natural. This is a company that uh, has a bitter blocker. So what's a bitter blocker? It's uh, a molecule that either binds to bitter things in a beverage, or actually in this case binds to your bitter receptors, so that you don't have to use the more common bitter blockers you find in food, which is sugar. This allows you to reduce the amount of sugar that you use in any sort of processed foods, et cetera, et cetera. Every flavor and fragrance company has a bitter, bitter blocker. The idea is not new. What's nice about this one is it comes from uh, the skins of cucumbers. So it's a waste product that through cool extraction chemistry and awesome formulation, you create a product that can reduce sugar amounts 50 to 75%. Um, it also blocks metallic taste, which is the big barrier to doing low sodium foods, because often your sodium replacements have a metallic taste that blocks that as well. Um, so brand new chemistry, brand new extraction technologies that allow you to have this clean label. The last one I put up there, partially because of uh, Francis Arnold winning the Nobel Prize this week, enzymes are a great way to hide awesome chemistry in a clean label. 
Don't forget that, Matt. <laughs> There's a huge opportunity. I mean, we've cleaned up detergents using industrial enzymes. The ability to get um, bacteria and other host organisms to express enzymes, express functional ingredients that can give you a clean label without sacrificing performance is a huge opportunity for all those molecular biologists and chemical biologists out there in the audience. So that's the first one, clean labels. That's what people are looking for. Second one, and I actually find that this is more at the brand and manufacturer retailer level, is the circular economy. This is particularly large in terms of the language in, in Europe. There's a lot of uh, even increasing regulations around what you're gonna do with your waste at the end of life there. But it's true here in the US because you know, all of you have seen pictures of the ocean gyre, and we can talk about issues around that. But let me tell you, every time Coke or Pepsi or Frito-Lay sees those pictures, they are holding their fingers crossed that their brand logo doesn't show up. And they want differentiated packaging, but they don't want to be associated with environmental impact like that. That's a motivator. So what does that mean for us? Remember, there are two things that can happen to the awesome stuff we make as chemists at the end of life. Um, one, well, three things. The third one I don't want you to do. One, it can become compostable, becomes a biological nutrient, and you put it into uh, either a commercial composter or your backyard, it turns back into plant food. Two, it can be recycled. We're not actually very good at that. We actually need a lot of help from those in the room about recycling, but that's the other option. The third option, of course, is you just burn it or throw it away, um, but we don't like those options. So on these two options, where's the chemistry here? So the chemistry is huge, especially in recycling, let me tell you, we need a lot better, we need to get a lot better at not only taking small molecules and turning them into large molecules, but taking large molecules and turning them into small molecules. If you could do that with polyolefins, it'd be amazing, but you can't. <laughs> I'm with uh, John, that uh, thermodynamics is working <laughs> the wrong direction there. But with polyesters, with polyamides, with um, a lot of other chemistry, protein-like chemistry, starch-like chemistry, you can start thinking about going in the other direction. In fact, there are now world-scale plants doing um, depolymerization of uh, polyethylene terephthalate, right, which is polyester. Um, new catalysts to do that, new designs. So the examples here are all design companies. I put Kenora up here because it should be a hometown favorite. Um, not only are they down in Hayward, but it's John Frechet technology. Um, so even if you think that your professors aren't working on applied things, and they probably aren't because this is Berkeley and we only work in basic science. Um, but even if you think they're only working on uh, uh, fundamental science, the reality is you can be creating the underlying molecular technologies that allow you to program when something comes apart or comes together. So the underlying technology of Kenora was a Jean Frechet uh, drug delivery system that allowed um, a micelle to fall apart when it was in the body. Now Knorr uses it so that you can take a thermoset, right, rigid plastics that you can't recycle, um, and at the end of life, unzip it so that it becomes a thermoplastic, something you can heat up and you can recycle. Um, Lindgrove is taking that to the next level. They're also a San Francisco company. They're saying, what if we could do that same thing but using all bio-based resins? So both bio-based resins as well as instead of carbon fiber reinforcement, using flax reinforcement. Ecologic is a fun one, a little less uh, chemistry, but they designed this split between these two systems into the actual bottle. They said, what do bottles do? They keep things safe and stable and they provide structure. For the structural element, let's use uh, paper, because it's fairly cheap, available, we can get it to be rigid. And for the protection, let's use plastic. And let's design a bottle that when you put it into uh, mixed recycling, it actually falls apart so that the paper ends up with the paper and the plastic ends up with the plastic. Because goodness knows, we're all lazy. Um, so the more we can design right into the uh, creation of an object, the better we are at its end of life. And that means chemists need to be involved. We need better uh, oxygen and water blockers for bio-based compostable uh, things. We need um, better technologies for unzipping uh, synthetic polymers. My last one, and actually one of the most fun, I wish I would have done more chemical biology and biology while I was in uh, graduate school, but this is for real and I love it. The public's opinion of bacteria is changing. The 50s are gone. 
the idea that we're just going to sterilize everything and become healthier is a thing of the past. Most of you, I would bet, have probably at least thought about a yogurt or some sort of probiotic drink as a part of your diet. And so there's growing acceptance of the, the gut microbiome. But the reality is the opportunity to, for bacteria to do productive work for us doesn't end at the gut. And it doesn't end at lactobacillus, people. For you uh, out there studying microbes, it's crazy. 99% of probiotic products that are out there, lactobacillus. Do you think that's the only bacteria in my gut doing work? No way. Billions of different bacteria. Using basic science to understand what those bacteria are and designing the next generation of probiotics that are gonna provide both therapeutic and health benefits, that's what Fit Biomics is doing. Using basic science developed at uh, Harvard and MIT and their control study is, well, what's different in one set of people's guts, high performance athletes, than another set of people's guts, everyone else. And it turns out you can find strains of bacteria and culture those strains of bacteria. Um, you could do the same for disease state, non-disease state. You can do the same for other sorts of uh, in, in, things that you're looking for. What I love about the other two examples is they take it out of your gut and move it into the daily, your daily life. Mother Dirt, um, head scientist over there in San Francisco, they actually have a product that you stick on your skin. It's a bacteria you put on your skin instead of lotion to help you uh, rebalance the bacteria cultures that you have on your body. Aunt Fanny's actually has a product that you spray on your uh, countertop, because why kill the bad bacteria? Let them be out competed by the good bacteria. This is fun, like this is uh, what the future looks like. I only have one more minute to tell you about the future, so let me tell you how we get there faster. That's the role of what I do now. I hope I've convinced you that there are opportunities, there's demand, how do we make the future happen faster? That's the role of capital. Capital is just a tool for making the future happen. So that's why we work with leaders across industries to understand where their pain points are. We gather capital from people who want to see a future where chemistry is better for human health and the environment, and then we support the people that are doing that. And I'm gonna skip my this because I'm out of time and just say it's been a real honor to work with the people who fill in all the gaps that I have. I'm just a poor country chemist. I grew up in Fresno. I don't know the first thing about capital markets. So if it wasn't for my partner, Adrian, who actually comes from the world of finance, if it weren't for all of our investors, including folks like Target, as well as a bunch of foundations who believe in this being the future, we wouldn't have been able to do what we have done today. And I want to remind you that no matter where you sit on this spectrum, you have capital. You have capital that you put to work every day. Um, and then for those of you who might be a little later in your career, you also have capital that other people are putting to work for you. So I encourage you to check to make sure that they're putting it to work in ways that align with your values, whatever they are. But um, it's the way we make the future. And that's why it's a pleasure to do SaferMade. Thank you.